traditional owners of the land yes, and our speakers are joining us from. We pay our respects to elders past and present. It's reconciliation week, so there's lots moving in this space and lots for us to reflect on. Just some housekeeping before we properly kick off. Um, we do use webinar mode, and this means that we won't actually be able to hear or see you throughout this webinar. So please pop your questions in the chat and we can put them to our speakers in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. We want as many questions as possible, so please don't be shy. Um, for those of you who are new to Farmers for Climate Action and maybe haven't heard of us before, welcome. Farmers for Climate Action is a movement of nearly 8,000 farmers right across Australia. Our mission is to influence Australia to adopt strong climate policies and realise a prosperous and sustainable future full of opportunity for farmers and our regional communities. A big thank you in advance to today's speakers, David Lindenmeyer and Les White, as well as Cam Close, our strategy director. Really looking forward to hearing what you've all got to say. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Cam to discuss the results of our recent farmer survey on the nature repair market. Over to you, Cam. Yeah, thanks, Emily. So just a bit of context. We knew that this bill has been sort of percolating around for a while. It's been introduced into the House and there's currently a uh, Senate inquiry into, you know, what what the bill, you know, the, the terms of reference of the bill. So what we did with, with this one was we decided we really wanted to hear from our farmers and have them shape the approach to, you know, our approach to this. So we sent out a few weeks ago a survey with, um, you know, with questions about it. And we had more than 455 farmers respond, which is an incredible, like quite frankly, an incredible response to this. We're overwhelmed with that. Um, and it was really interesting. So the overwhelming majority of our farmers supported the development of a nature repair market. And while there was still, you know, about two thirds supported it, about one third were unsure, but very few people didn't support the development of a nature repair market. But then when we flipped them, we asked a little bit about offsets about 55% didn't support offsets within this scheme. Another 30% were unsure. So there was a vast majority of people there who didn't support the use of offsets. And then when we asked people whether or not they'd like to participate in the scheme, about two thirds again said they'd like to participate in the scheme with another third unsure. So there's pretty strong support for the concept of the scheme, for farmers wanting to participate in it. And just that high level of uncertainty we think sort of reflects the fact that it's a complex bill and a lot of farmers don't really necessarily know, uh, you know, what, what the bill's about yet. And that makes sense. And that's sort of why we've convened this webinar today to sort of go into it with a bit more depth about the, the background, what's led up to it, and then also some of the details of it. So just a really short snapshot of some of the, you know, some further, further thoughts from our farmers. So farmers were over, you know, our farmer respondents were overwhelming in the fact that they wanted the scheme to produce a net gain for the environment. So they didn't just want it to maintain the status quo and sort of stop the degradation of the environment and biodiversity, they wanted a net gain. Um, and then, and then the flip side of that is there was a lot of distrust about using the scheme for carbon offsets. Um, and that sort of has built off the safeguard work that we did and, you know, the Chubb review that's been done, but there was a lot of uncertainty about that, you know, this biodiversity work also being used as carbon offsets. And that's partly also because I think there's a lot of distrust in the carbon offset scheme. And, uh, you know, a lot of farmers and a lot of experts feel as though historically it's been prone to corruption. Um, and then just the other, the other sort of simple takeaways was a desire for smaller landholders and, you know, smaller scale farmers to be able to access the scheme. A lot of farmers would really like that and a feeling that the federal government is better equipped to handle biodiversity programs in the states. Um, so to go into more detail about that, um, we'll throw to Les White. So Les, is a, Les grew up on a Gippsland beef farm. He was a journalist at um, Fairfax, Country, uh, Fairfax Country Papers for a while. And then he also spent five years writing for the Weekly Times. Um, and he was their federal politics writer based in Parliament House. He's also been a senior advisor and deputy chief of staff to senior state and federal ministers, um, including a federal agricultural minister. He now runs a consultancy business and we're lucky enough to get to work quite closely with Les. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I hand over to Les to describe a little bit more about the scheme and the history of it. Thanks so much, Cam, brilliant. 
Um, and what a bunch of really sophisticated, really interesting responses from farmers, really engaged group, really, really interesting comments if anybody gets the chance to read them. And we'll, I think we're going to run through a few of them in a bit. Uh, so I'm not going to go right through the history of the scheme because I don't want to bore you all, but I do want to get across a few key sort of principles that it, that it began with. Um, and so it really, really one little proud became agriculture minister that was at the end of 2017 <clears throat> and in the year after that he started to push for a scheme that would reward farmers for the biodiversity on their farm um, and so this was the this was the basic thing this was the thing that I mocked up at the time just to try and get the concept across so at the top um, you've got a farm operating before it gets involved with the scheme obviously on that pasture you might be making quite good money um, just just before anybody does, I know that Australia has very different rainfall right across the country and it's wildly variable. So you just had to pick a number as an example. But as an example, let's just say you're making $400 a year on the pasture that you've got because you've got cattle grazing on it. Um, in that top left corner of that slide, you've got a bit of remnant vegetation on your farm. You're actually probably losing money on that because you're paying rates on it and you're still, you're still having to expend money on peat and, uh, West... <laughs> weed and pest control on that. And then the same with that slope leaning down to the creek, you know, the cattle aren't getting um, any goodness out of that. There's not really great pasture there. It might be a bit muddy or whatever, or difficult um, for them to inhabit. And so you're losing money on that as well because you're, you're still spending money on the rates and the pest and weed control. Um, if you look down to the next slide, that just tried to illustrate that, you know, that top left-hand corner now, maybe you've entered the enhancing remnant vegetation pilot or what, what will hopefully be this scheme. And so you're getting paid to enhance or maintain that remnant vegetation in your top left-hand corner, and you might be making 30 bucks per hectare per year off that. So that's not a huge amount, but what it has done is it's switched it from being a negative for the farmer to a positive for the farmer. And I think you can see really clearly from the results of the Farmers for Climate Action survey that farmers are actually wrapped at the idea that they're increasing vegetation. They want to do it. They just don't want to have to, um, you know, cop a massive financial impost for it. And then um, slightly still in that middle slide, the carbon and diversity payment in the bottom left-hand corner of that middle slide. Uh, that farmer um, is participating in that carbon and biodiversity market where you've planted some mixed species forest there and it's growing back. And so because you're getting paid for carbon and biodiversity on that, the, the payment might be more like $100 a year. Again, it's not, it's not going to pay you the same as running beef or cattle, um, but now you're starting to get passive, uh, now you're starting to get income that produces all the time. Um, and down in the bottom slide, this was just to illustrate that the payments as they're scheduled, they still land um, every couple of years, even during drought. So you've got some income that's now no longer uh, dependent on rainfall that year. So even if you've had to destock and even if you're feeding your cattle um, that are obviously inhabiting that pasture part of your farm, you're still getting some, some income from the, from the enhancing remnant vegetation and also from that carbon and biodiversity payment. Um, there was probably three key principles that were that were stated at the time, um, and everybody that that uh, came into this process had to sort of get on board with them and agree with them. Um, so the three key principles were that the scheme has to have integrity. So we've seen around the world in many different schemes, if the scheme doesn't have integrity, eventually there's an expose, and it shows that what people are being paying for is not real, whether it's carbon or whether it's biodiversity. And then that scheme collapses because the value of those, be it carbon credits or biodiversity credits, becomes worth nothing when the market realises that they're not real, that they're actually not real credits. So that was the number one rule, has to have integrity. Um, the second one was that the um, farmer had to make a dollar out of it. So it couldn't be such a small amount that it wouldn't change behaviour. We wanted, we wanted there to be a reasonable payment so that farmers um, that wanted to do um, biodiversity and conservation work on their land would be paid properly for it and actually make it worth doing. And the third uh, the third piece was that um, the biodiversity increase had to be real and measurable. So you can't get paid for um, you can't get paid for doing nothing basically. It's not free money. Um, when you when you're using taxpayer money, you want to spend that in a way that actually creates the outcome you're looking for. And so the third rule was that there, there had to be a real and measurable increase in biodiversity. So I guess that sort of goes back to the integrity piece again. And I think you can see in those in those responses to the Farmers for Climate Action survey, people are farmers are super interested in the integrity piece. They really want it to work. Um, just I'll just wrap up before um, before Em asks a couple of questions. Just the, the there there was a veto power brought into it. So I'm sure. Every farmer on here will remember the managed investment schemes fiasco of the of the 2000s. And so to avoid that kind of mass takeover of 
big tracts of land where companies just go around buying big farms up and just making them into plantations. Uh, there was a veto rule introduced where uh, for any for any plantation that was more than 15 hectares and where it was more than a third of that farm, the minister had a right of veto. So the Minister for Agriculture can still choose right now um, whether that project is granted taxpayer funding or not. So the project could still go ahead. You can still buy a farm and you can still plan 100% of it to, um, to a carbon and biodiversity um, scheme, but you would have to seek private market to pay for it you'd have to get a business to pay for that rather than um, taxpayer dollars because the the minister for agriculture um, has the right to say well no we won't go ahead with that um, because we don't want those massive tracts of land taken over so it was actually kind of aimed at trying to get family farmers involved and make sure that the benefit went to family farmers who were setting aside a piece of their property rather than to those sort of massive corporations that can come in and and buy up enormous tracts of land. Thanks, Les. That was a really clear overview of quite a complex issue. So I'm sure everyone has really appreciated that. And there's so much to, you know, digest and unpack. So I have some initial questions for you to start teasing sure. this out a little more. Um, don't worry, everyone, we will get to your questions at the end. So you heard the farmer feedback on the scheme from our survey. Can you speak a little more um, about what you think of that? I know you've touched on this a bit already, but there was quite a lot to unpack in the responses. So what really yeah, jumped out for you? Uh, honestly, the sophistication of the response, sorry, firstly, the volume of them, right? Like to get more than 450, and I think that was up for four days. That's a yep. lot of farmers writing in with thoughts on them. And then when you actually go through them, um, I actually jotted down some of the comments because I found them um, that the farmers are super engaged and the responses are super sophisticated. So some of the stuff that really impressed me, um, we need to ensure that this is truly beneficial to biodiversity and not an excuse for greenwashing. Like, I think it just shows you, you know, the economists would like to tell you that everybody's just motivated by money. The only, you know, the only way to predict human behaviour is to provide a financial incentive. Well, that's not what came back in the comments. The farmers were really motivated by integrity, I thought. Um, can have very poor outcomes if rigour is not applied to assessing offsets versus development. It can become a licence to continue business as usual whilst giving the appearance of an of environmental good. So again, another farmer saying, you know, I'm interested in this, well, I think they're saying I'm interested in this scheme, but don't just make this a greenwashing thing. Like, I don't want to be the excuse for you to bulldoze a bunch of Daintree rainforest. Um, yeah, I was just, just super, in, I was just super impressed with them. And honestly, if you when you read through those comments, it's literally, I reckon two thirds of them have an integrity component to them. Just really impressive. Yeah. So let's um, dive into the integrity topic a little more. So offsets in particular were obviously a hot topic for farmers in the survey. Yeah. Offsets would be allowed as part of the scheme as it's currently written. So do you think that's yeah. a good idea? Um, no, I, I don't. It wasn't in the initial scheme. So. Just for those of you playing along at home, um, the reason that a lot, the reason that many people oppose offsets is because you can never reconstruct what existed somewhere else. So if you bulldoze a bunch of koala habitat on the Cumberland Plain, you know, west of Sydney, and then you ask a farmer at Dubbo to regrow that habitat, there's not actually a pop, there's, there's not actually a koala population out there to, to live in it. So you're not getting like for like. Um, and the and the experts that that we did bring in, so uh, earlier when I was talking about the introduction of this thing, um, we had the Australian National University one that won the contract to build the design, basically. And I can't tell you how thrilled I was with that because, you know, I got to work with people of the calibre of Professor Linda May, the most referenced forest ecologist on the planet, um, of Professor Phil Gibbons, like super respected ecologist here in Australia who's done these exact sort of schemes and Andrew McIntosh whose name is just Professor Andrew McIntosh whose name is just synonymous with integrity around carbon um, and so working with these guys was a massive thrill and that's what I think gave the gave the idea its integrity um, I don't I don't think the farmers want to do offsets but I've just always opposed the idea because you're not going to reconstruct what was somewhere exactly as it was somewhere else it's it's not a like for like usually um, also I'm a bit nervous about the idea that the market drives that. So um, we all know that there's a bunch of corporations that need or want to, to clear land. Um, but, you know, there's, it's got to be done with integrity if it has to be done. And I just think this market needs to be driven, hopefully, mostly by taxpayer dollars. Maybe, um, maybe you can get some others 
companies in there that are voluntarily saying, well, we want additional biodiversity. So we're just going to go out. We're not clearing any land, but we're going to go and pay farmers to grow more biodiversity. That's the outcome that we're looking for. Brilliant. Thanks, Les. I think you comprehensively covered all of the issues around integrity. Um, and there's a lot for our farmers to think about there. So we'll now head on to our next speaker, Professor David Lindenmeyer. So Professor David Lindenmeyer is a world leading expert in forest ecology, resource management, conservation science and biodiversity conservation. He's made major contributions to key fields in the life and environmental sciences. He's established seven large scale long term research programs, has over 820 papers published in peer reviewed journals and has authored or co-authored 47 books. He's lived and breathed these issues that we're covering today, so I can't wait to hear what he's got to say. So David, to kick us off, can you maybe talk a little bit about your background around on-farm biodiversity and the nature repair market to give us some of that context? Thanks, Emily. Yeah, so my, my um, background goes back in, in the farm sector, actually to my, my relations in central Queensland, who, who actually started in the, in the cattle business in the 1860s and had quite a strong stewardship ethic across their land in that part of central Queensland for, for many, many, many decades. And then mates, part of the family made some poor decisions about, about extensive land clearing, and some of them went bankrupt and had to leave the land. And so I've been cognizant of these kinds of issues for quite some time. Then we started in, in the late 1990s we were asked to begin to monitor what was some of the outcomes from the Natural Heritage Trust. Because even though a lot of money was spent at that stage, nobody really knew how we were tracking. We mm -hmm. knew how many kilometres of fences had been put in. We knew that a lot of trees had been planted, but we didn't actually know if it was effective and we didn't know what the biodiversity dividend of those investments were. So a lot of our long-term monitoring now still builds on the early work from Landcare, from the NHT and elsewhere. And it's it's uh, really quite instructive to see how things have changed, what we can do well, what wasn't done so well and how it might improve. And a lot of that understanding then forms a really important platform for a nature repair market in the sense of knowing what the right kinds of standards might be if we're going to do a planting, if we're going to renovate a farm dam, if we're going to protect a rocky outcrop, those, those kinds of things. Because we need those kinds of standards to, to make sure that we're maximising the chances we're going to have an effective outcome. We've also understood a lot about the importance of monitoring in this space. And monitoring is, is often the sort of the Cinderella science where, you know, it's sort of in the background. It's actually really important, but, you know, my colleagues in the art sector say that it's always possible to get the money to buy a new painting, but it's impossible to get the air conditioning to, to keep the painting in good, good nick. So monitoring is really important in this space, not only to track how things are changing, but also to provide the credibility for, for these kinds of markets. So we think of this in the context of three kinds of monitoring. Compliance monitoring, so did farmer Wendy actually do what she said she was going to do? Inputs monitoring, which means did farmer Bill actually spend the money that he was given to do what he was supposed to do in his contract? And then the outcomes monitoring is what was the biodiversity dividend of, of those management interventions? And sometimes it will take a long time to see those changes. And the, the advantage here is that we've already got 25 years of long-term monitoring to, to show us what the likely outcomes of those interventions are going to be. Brilliant, thank you. Um, diving into monitoring a little more, can you maybe explain um, why monitoring needs people on the ground? Yeah, so there are, there are some people that believe that, that if we just run a satellite over the top of, of uh, someone's farm, then we'll be able to know what's going on. Now, satellites are valuable because they'll tell us, you know, what's what was the area of planting, what was the area of remnant bush, what's the size of paddocks, those kinds of things. But to really understand the changes that are taking place, there are certain kinds of indicator species and proxies and others that you actually need a high level of skill to be able to, to identify. 
No satellite is going to be able to tell you what species of birds are there. No satellite is going to be able to count the scales on the back of one of six or seven different olive to brown colored slithery things, one of them which will kill you, and the other five or six might make you feel so well, but they're actually very, very important species in terms of their responses to grazing practices. And so there's a, there's a high level of skill needed on the ground. That's important so that the monitoring is independent. It needs to be independent of the person or the farmer or the farming family that's gonna receive the benefit of the, of the investment through the nature repair market. The independence is important also not only because of the technical skill involved, but, but the credibility of the market, but also because it provides a source of information about you know, how might this plant planting behave in terms of its suitability for habitat over time? Why, why will it be tracking in this particular way? And what's the sort of advice? You know, do you graze it? If you're gonna graze it, how infrequently or frequently should you do it? You know, that becomes that conduit of information because often farming is a very lonely business, as we all know, and that person-to-person -person contact is critical as, as an information process, but also as a, as a way to communicate scientific information, which is often not readily available to people. You know, three or four people might read a scientific paper that you write, if you're lucky. So it needs to be communicated in a way which is more accessible to the people that have funded it, which is the taxpayer, including farmers. Yep, absolutely. I think I agree wholeheartedly with all of that. And so do many of the farmers that I talk to. There's just no replacement for having people on the ground when it comes to biodiversity monitoring and advice. So another question on the theme of integrity. Um, this was another popular question from our farmers. Can you please explain why a nature repair market needs standards? And I know Les touched on this, but I'd be keen to hear your perspective as well. Well, I think one of the key things here is that the scale of the restoration challenge is truly enormous. You know, globally, it's it's about 3 billion hectares or the size of, of Russia. And the estimate is that it's about $21 trillion of investment needed to tackle the problem, which is way, way beyond the scope of normal grants processes. So up until uh, up until the moment, with this moment, we've really focused on grants to land care, um, those, those, kinds of, those kinds of things. And they've been very, very important, you know, through, through land care, natural heritage, trust, others. But the scale of the problem is beyond that. And so we need to think about other ways to bring in new kinds of finance to help, help us make the transition to, to repairing some of the, the, the land degradation that we've seen. And to be able to, to sandbag some of the things that we've got to do to ensure not only a biodiversity response, but to also at least maintain and in some cases improve the productivity of the land that, that farmers are working on. And so that's really exercised our mind significantly over the last five to six years. What other forms of finance might be able to be brought to bear here that aren't going to add hugely to farmers' debts? but actually help us think about nature repair. So some of our work has included some, some interesting analysis with Bruce Chapman, who was the inventor of the HEX Higher Education Contribution Scheme in, um, at university, where people take on a loan to become better educated, to set themselves up to, to earn a higher salary later in life, and then when they're able to do so, when they're able to afford to pay back their loans, then they're able to start to paying that down. And we've been thinking about that in the context of the farming space. When, for example, you improve the quality of the water in your farm dams through a renovation process, then you should see greater weight gain in your cattle, for example. You would also see a biodiversity dividend from doing that. So that, that then, opens up opportunities for ways to, to fund people to do these things without massively increasing their debt burden like happens with a normal loan. You take out a normal loan, you have to pay it back from day one. With a revenue contingent loan, like in the HEX system, but in the farming space, you would only start to pay back that loan once you had greater profitability in, in, uh, in the landscape in, on your farm. 
and you were seeing better times. And during extreme times like droughts, uh, big market downturns, you, you wouldn't be putting pressure on farmers to, to um, pay back their loans at, when times like that. And so there's been a lot of thought about how those systems won't be gamed as well. Bruce has put a lot of thought in, in that space. So the bottom line really is that the scale of the problem is beyond the normal financing approaches. And we need to be thinking about creative ways that, that governments and financial institutions can step in to actually help us on this pathway. Wow, what an interesting idea, a hex style scheme for on-farm biodiversity. I'm sure that will be a very popular topic for questions from the audience. So if you've got any, please send them in. So on to our next theme, um, do we actually have enough knowledge and data to make a start on paying farmers for biodiversity right now? And the answer is absolutely yes. So we can use the information from many, many farmers sites that we've we've studied and monitored dating right back to 1998. So we know what a good planting looks like for the temperate woodland belt from central Victoria to southeast Queensland. And that would extend across to South Australia and probably the Midlands of Tasmania. So we've got we've got pretty good information about some of these these kinds of things. We've got a good understanding of the kind of model for the monitoring that can help guide this. And some of that information will extend to other places or other natural assets, such as paddock trees, shelter belts, um, farm dams, even grazing regimes. So we can use the knowledge that we have so far to start to, to guide some of this, because with the right predictive tools, we can give most farmers in that kind of area a kind of understanding of where their natural assets will be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time if they undertake certain kinds of actions now. Of course, there's a lot more to learn. Of course, there are other ecosystems that aren't covered by that, but that really just indicates that we need to, to invest more in this area to get the monitoring and the data streams right. There are other existing long-term studies that, that and monitoring that can help us in this space. And it's a matter of uh, pulling this together and it's, it's not impossible to do, and nowhere else in the world has done this. So Australia would be a world leader if we were to embrace this and to be able to truly demonstrate that the sorts of things that are being done actually do lead to improvements and that the quality of the monitoring can really tell us whether we're on the right path or whether we need to make some changes to, to do things better. For example, under the last, in a, one of the initial stages of NHT, there was a lot of planting of tree lanes so these were single trees going a long way into the distance, and they actually created habitat for the noisy miner, which is a very nasty, hyper-aggressive bird species that drives down other, other bird species in these landscapes. So that was a mistake. But it, all's not lost. Essentially, it means that we've learned from that and we're able to rework the way that we do our plantings to drive down the numbers of those animals and bring back other species that we want to nurture populations of on farms. And they often don't have to be huge, huge differences in practice. It's just a matter of making sure we've got the right monitoring to tell us what the, the real outcomes are and that we can provide that monitoring data to the people that need it, including the NRM groups like land care, catchment management authorities, local land services and others, so that they can be up to speed about what the latest knowledge is showing and what the data the monitoring data is, is all about. This is really about partnerships. It's about scientists working with farmers, scientists and farmers working with land care and, and in our own groups to take us to a better place. Brilliant, thank you. I'm sure our farmers will be glad to hear that they can get started on this soon. And I also didn't realize we'll, we were actually a world leader in this space, so that's very exciting to hear. Um, on to another topic that comes up a lot when we talk about nature repair markets. Will this scheme mean a lot of regulation and bureaucracy for farmers? Um, because this is something that farmers obviously want to avoid. Yeah, that's a good question. And it is a concern. I think the way that we work in this space with, with good monitoring, independent monitoring, farmers aren't going to be asked to do that. They're not going to be asked to differentiate between the six or seven species of olive-coloured snakes on their property. I think it's best if it's done independently. It doesn't have to be 
a massive exercise with every planting and every grazing regime monitored on every farm. We don't need to do that. We can have a strong sample of farms and sites to give us an indication of what the right standards are to be able to support um, a nature repair market and an income stream that way. So because we monitor farmer Wendy and farmer, farmer Bill's property, it doesn't mean that we have to do farmer, um, farmer um, Fred and, and farmer whoever's property as well. We have a sufficient sample to tell us what's likely to happen if we do things in a certain way. So I, I think the notion of having an appropriate sample with enough statistical power and the right design will give us the kinds of information to create the standards that will be able to, to, um, to take us to a better place. So it doesn't have to be a massive regulatory burden. I think it's the sort of thing that government will need to support in the monitoring space. And the data from this can be available to anybody that needs it, who wants to see it in an independent sense, and, and to, be, to be able to use, be used in that way so that there's, there's credibility in the market, there's data to see whether things are changing in the right way. And often it'll be need to be long-term because Australia is very variable in its climate. And some of these natural assets only become really important, for example, during droughts, and their effects are dissipated during the wetter times, and then they come back again in, in the subsequent drought. So having it long-term over many sites on many farms is important, but we don't need to be everywhere all at once. Great, thank you. All of that, I'm sure, will be very encouraging to hear for our farmers. Um, back to offsets again. Do you think that offsets should be allowed under the scheme? I know Les had some pretty strong opinions on this. Um, are yours the same? Yeah, mine are pretty similar to Les's. I have deep problems with offsets because the, the fundamental principle behind offsets is this idea of no net loss. And that's very, very hard to do in the environment space because no two places in the landscape are the same. And particularly in some of our landscapes that have had a long history of, of heavy disturbance often what's remaining is very, very important. And what's remaining is often the core for, for the way that we're going to, to start on this restoration journey. So that's a key principle in restoration is that you keep what you've already got and then you build on that and take it from there. So we wanna, wherever we can, we don't wanna lose those core natural assets. We wanna build on them to, to take us on the right pathway. So I do have some deep concerns about, about offsets. I've seen some, some very, very poorly done ones. Uh, we wrote a paper about um, the anatomy of a failed offset in Southern New South Wales. And um, that was by no means the worst, but it wasn't a good outcome. And I, I, I'm not, not for stopping all development, don't get me wrong, but I think we need to be very careful about how we assess those developments and face up to the reality as to whether there really is a true offset. In many cases, there simply won't be. Yep, yep. I think we at Farmers for Climate Action broadly agree with all of that. Um, I wondered if there were any other integrity issues that you wanted to draw out before we go on to audience questions. Yeah, I think there's a timing issue. So what we don't want to see is um, some of these beautiful farms that we've worked on where people have worked so hard over so many years and there are a lot of farmers that have done that with replantings and changing grazing regimes building up around regenerative agriculture and, and other ways of, of um, restoring the natural assets on their farms we don't want to create the, the um, perverse incentives for people to rush around and clear everything put their hand up after that and say give me money to replant my my um, vegetation. That would be a huge negative outcome. And we really do want to avoid those kinds of things. And I think it would be very valuable to ensure that, you know, those farmers that have been on these journeys for many, many years have, have some basis for being rewarded for, for what they've done and then uh, encourage others to come into this space so that they too can be rewarded over time for, for doing the right thing. I think there's a really problematic perspective from some um, city dwelling folk in Australia that farmers are environmental vandals 
I think we need to change that narrative that uh, what happens on the 55% of Australia that's in, in agricultural hands uh, has an enormous amount to contribute to restoring biodiversity, um, building up carbon stocks and providing new ways of, of finance to be able to help us uh, in that space. If I could just comment really quickly on that perverse outcome for clearing um, that is dealt with in the, in the legislation. I think it's seven years, so you can't get paid um, for planning carbon and biodiversity plannings on land if you've cleared it in the last seven years. So um, that was the attempt to try and make sure that there was no perverse uh, incentive to clear land. Great. Thanks, David and Les. Really appreciate you breaking down all of these issues for everyone listening in. So now we might go to audience questions where we can dive into all of this even more deeply. So keep those questions coming in. Um, looks like there's a healthy number of questions already, but you know, we've got 20 minutes, so keep them coming. So the first question, and all of these questions will be to both of you, I think. Do you think a market approach is the best way to incentivize farmers to increase biodiversity? And do you think this bill is a good step forward? Um, this one you've already touched on, but maybe you can talk to why the other alternatives won't quite cut the mustard. My, my sense is that we need we need as many different strings to our bow as possible here. So I think we don't want to be giving up on land care. We don't want to walk away from that. Remember, land care is not just about environment. It's also a, a social connection, which is so important. And our mental health research in our Sustainable Farms project shows that farmers that are involved in land care are also in a better state of mental health. And so that participation is really important. So the last thing we want to do is be throwing away things like that that can be important. That's crucial. I think the the, the bottom line is that there are there's so many challenges in this space. We have to look at other ways of bringing more more money and more support in, into this space to to push this along faster and and over larger areas. So. I know there's a lot of people that are deeply worried about the commodification of nature. I get that. But I also think we have to, to think about what are the novel and creative ways that we can we can tackle these kinds of issues. Yeah, I sort of agree with David on, you've got to have a lot of strings to your bow. Um, one thing that I always noticed when I work for governments is the idea of a silver bullet is just so alluring, it's so enticing and everyone wants to believe that there's this magical one thing that will fix um, the fact that our biodiversity in nature has been, uh, you know, so uh, reduced, but that there's not a silver bullet, there never is. So I think we have to do all of the things that we can all of the time. Right. I, 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 Emily, I have real concerns about where we're at in, in Australia, given our record on extinctions and land clearing and the potential for that to eventually affect our, our access to markets overseas. Uh, I hear those kinds of things talking to some of the, the ambassadors of different countries, especially in Europe in this space. And I think it's really important to, to start on a pathway to show people in other parts of the world that we're really serious about doing something about this mm -hmm. um, and trying to, to match the scale of effort relative to the scale of the problem. Yeah, there's been, I mean, there's a push in the EU now that, you know, it's not just carbon neutrality they're after. They are after farmers to uh, show some biodiversity credentials. So I think the idea that actually Oscar Pierce, one of our great farmers at, um, at Farmers for Climate Action, who was also involved in the initial stages of this scheme, he was contracting to NFF. He said a great thing to me one day about, of course, it's lovely to get paid for that stuff, but also you've got to keep up with world trends and your reward for that is that you get to keep being a farmer. You get to keep producing and selling your stuff. Yeah, access to overseas markets is definitely something our farmers are keen to maintain. Um, on to a more specific question. Does this bill have any ideas for dealing with feral animals? Yeah, so as it, as it stood, the enhancing, rem and we got a good question about this, by the way, just before, the enhancing remnant vegetation pilot, um, so this will answer several questions at once that I saw in the audience feed, um, that was the idea to try and reward the farmers that had already been doing good things. So um, the idea is just that you would get paid to protect and enhance that remnant vegetation on your land. And it, it might just mean putting a one or two 
wire fence around it. Um, but you also you want to you want to be you want to be getting rid of those pests and weeds, and that does make a genuine improvement. So that was that was the idea with that. Um, I've I just noticed someone saying in there that that's not actually in the bill at all. Um, I've just tried to check that. I, I assume that that's correct. Um, that's a great shame if it's not, because I, I think you really do have to reward those farmers that have been doing the right thing. Um, the big problem in politics today is the tribalism. It's that they want to fight over everything. And the last thing we want is to split the farm community on, a, on, a, on an initiative like this. I think you've got to make sure that the guys that have been doing the right thing are getting rewarded for it. And the guys that this incentivizes to do the right thing also should be rewarded. Great, thank you. Um, we have a, quite a few questions about costs and expenses. So um, one question, good quality biodiversity enhancement is really expensive and requires good advice from experts who have the knowledge of local species, planting techniques and monitoring programs. Who pays for the biodiversity enhancement costs and the uh, technical advice? Yeah, so the, so the government was paying for it is the short answer. That was the idea of the scheme. So it doesn't come out of the farmer's pocket. Yeah, so they would pay. Look, like my vision was that they would pay um, an organisation like ANU that's truly independent, that has genuine, um, you know, world class ecologists at it. And um, I'll throw to David in a minute because he's made the point to me: you don't need to survey every single farm to get a reliable result. You know, so let's not have any panic about that. Um, just before I throw to him, I did see this great meme the other day where somebody was saying, "Oh, why is it that some people seem to think you don't need to be an ecologist and you can just have a look and you." You are good enough to know that you wouldn't think that if you're on a plane like nobody gets angry and then says oh i don't like this pilot i think i can do better who here thinks i should fly this plane you don't you know you recognize the expertise of the pilot and i think we need to recognize the expertise of the ecologists too i think one of the important things here emily and 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 others is that it's, it's the way the model works to gather the data means that you're the, the, the onus is on the scientists who are doing this to make sure that their science is communicated to the to the people that are the practitioners on the ground. So to support the practice change in this space. So we, through the Sustainable Farms Project, we now have nearly 5,000 people through the various networks. So we're supporting, supporting land care, we're supporting local land services, we're supporting catchment management authorities to be up to date with what the, the latest monitoring is telling us and the peer reviewed science is, is showing us to, to be able to help guide this, this process. So it's not locked away in a journal that nobody can access or can't get past the gate, gatekeepers. It's, it's information that's provided quickly once it comes through. You know, a really good example in this space is some work on farm dams that was actually instigated by David Lukproud when he was former minister. Very, very quickly, we can see that a renovation action for the farm dam with some small areas of planting and fencing around a farm dam, we can improve biodiversity almost within six months and massively so within a year. We can see that the amount of effluent that's going into a farm dam is dramatically re reduced. So the greenhouse gas emissions from a farm dam are re reduced by 56% within a year. So now there's been some methodology discussion uh, in Canberra in Parliament about how some of these renovation actions might give you both a carbon dividend and a biodiversity dividend as a response. But on top of that, there's actually a producti productivity gain because livestock are drinking high quality water so that their weight gain is actually increased. So I, th I think there's there are ways to bring that science more quickly to more people with a good set of standards around what's an appropriate renovation for particular dams. And, and that's where we really start to get to an exciting space where, you know, because the vast majority of wetlands are gone, most wetlands, the proxy is actually well-managed farm dams, we can really make a difference in that space, but through carbon accounting and, and greenhouse gas emissions as well, because most of the gases coming off farm dams are methane and nitrous oxide, which are not good things to be putting in the air. I think that the big selling point for that farm dams thing is the productivity gain. Like as soon as you've got your cattle and sheep putting on more weight faster, making you more money, you know, farmers are interested and then the politicians will be interested, hopefully. 
Yeah, for sure. And it's really encouraging to hear that you can have such a quick turnaround time when it comes to improving biodiversity on farm. It's great that you can get some results nice and quick. Mm -hmm. So this is another one that our farmers care a lot about. Will the nature repair market also focus on improving soil biodiversity on the farmed portion of the farm? Um, and maybe in the other portion as well, if you want to just talk to whether it includes soil more broadly. Yeah, so that wasn't that wasn't really the aim of the scheme. Um, absolutely acknowledge the issue. Um, I wish that I was king of the government, but I'm not. Um, that's something I'd love to deal with. There is some funding available and Soils for Life does some great work in this space too, um, and definitely an issue that, you know, we should take up with governments and draw attention to. Did you Emily, want to I saw a question there from someone had chimed in and asked, how, how does uh, restoration around farm dams change the greenhouse gas emissions profile? So just, just briefly, uh, we, we have a whole lot of information that's published on that. I'm, I'm happy to get emails and then send information out to people. And I'm not here to sell books, but I can sell, I can sell um, scientific papers that won't cost you anything. But what happens with a farm dam is the farm dam is in the lowest part of a paddock normally for, for where you uh, want to catch water. What often happens when paddocks are heavily grazed is that the animal waste is washed into the dam. So the, so the, the uh, all the nitrogenous waste, when you add water to it, in the dam, you get nitrous oxide. And when you have a fecal animal waste, you add water to that and you get methane. So by planting around your dam and fencing it out, either to then pump water to a trough or to have a hardened access point so that animals can only access the water through one part of the, the dam, you're reducing the amount of effluent that goes into the dam. So you're then reducing the amount of methane and nitrous oxide that's given off. And so when we've monitored dams that are renovated versus control dams that are not, we see this colossal difference in the emissions profile of the two different kinds of dams. And so we have a sample of nearly 130 dams that have, that have done exactly that. I'm more than happy to provide the, the peer reviewed paper that shows exactly that. But it's an enormous outcome, as Les says, you, you, there's a weight gain dividend, there's a biodiversity dividend, there's a greenhouse gas dividend, and on the horizon is going to be an animal welfare issue. And so we want to be able to, to look at that as well. And the fifth thing that's important, it's not yet published, but with the appropriate renovation with trees, trees not on the dam wall, but planted strategically, it looks as though we can reduce about evaporation from, from dams by, in some cases, up to 30%. So that's water persistence, that's looking at drought resilience. You know, so there's another benefit of these kinds of approaches. If we do them right, there's an income stream that comes from the, the intervention. There's a profitability outcome from, from animals that can uh, put on weight faster. And there's a drought resilience dividend that comes from not having to turn off your stock as quickly. So there's some pretty exciting outcomes here to take us on that path. I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunities that exist in this space. Definitely. Um, just there have been a couple of questions about this, but when it comes to data management, you know, farmers can be a bit sceptical when it comes to providing their data to the government. Um, they're worried that it might come back to bite them. So what measures are being proposed to allay these concerns? So we've been collecting data on farms for since 1998. And, and there's a whole lot of sensitivities about that. So often it's possible to de-identify, in fact, it is possible to de-identify which farm came, had animals of certain kinds in what places. In some places, there are huge sensitivities over particular threatened species. In other places, farmers are quite excited to know that after they'd made a certain kind of management intervention, they started getting swift parrots or region honey eaters or whatever. And we know that they actually ring each other up and they compete with one another and ask each other, you know, did you get this? Did you get that? Those kinds of things. So if this is done independently and it's done with the right model, it's possible to provide farmers with a list of the kinds of things that are, that, that are being detected 
on their on their property and where. It's possible to provide the data to government, but in a de-identified way, so that uh, that information doesn't get into the wrong hands. And that is important. We know we've had some very difficult situations with state governments where some of the threatened species data has been uh, had to be uploaded to their databases and then within weeks we had poachers on some of these farms uh, so so there are ways of of avoiding this there are culturally sensitive species and other kinds of things and but there are ways of handling this and often it'll be an agreement with a, with a farmer about you know what's collected where what can be put into a database what what can't, how does it, how is it de-identified, those kinds of things. That's that's important. That's a big issue. And it's one that we've we've overcome those issues over the last two and a half decades of doing this. Great. It's um really good to hear that these issues are being tackled. So this is an interesting one. Um, will an unregulated market emerge in this space similar to carbon? And will that be a good thing? Uh, so I can tell you a little, so my partner works in banking. Um, the first part of my response would be that if the, it's difficult to have an unregulated market because it'll be seen as lacking in integrity. So if you want a really big buyer, if you want, um, if you want your Commonwealth banks and your AGLs to be out there buying big biodiversity credits or big carbon credits, they're not going to take a risk on anything that they think might lack integrity because two years or five years or 10 years from now, that could be a big story in the newspaper that really hurts that. Um, that organisation um, makes them look like they have no integrity. And in the case of um, companies on the stock market, it really hurts their share price. You know, it can really hit them. Um, so the second part, though, is I think that there, I mean, there obviously there is a voluntary market. There is a voluntary market for carbon in this country and for um, and a bit for biodiversity as well. So um, I think that's a possibility. But I think that the main game is is going to be the, the official market. Emily, my sense of this is that if if it's going to start to to play into our trading arrangements it's got to be squeaky clean it's got to be real it's got to be so that a minister or a prime minister on a trade delegation can stand up and and with truth and integrity actually say we have proper monitoring to show what's happening where and why so you know one of my great hopes as time goes on is that we might be able to have a, a QR code on a farm to show that this is what farmer Wendy has done over the last 15 years. And if you want to look deeper, this is the profile of what's happened to how many more bird species or how many more plant species that she has on her farm as a consequence of the interventions that she's made. That's a great idea. Um, I'm sure many of our farmers would be on board with that. So, now, this is a common one that pops up. Um, yeah. So what does the Nature Repair Market Bill mean for those who've been protecting land up to now? Will they miss out on getting paid for the work that they've been doing? And will it reward people who haven't necessarily been implementing good practices, um, which I guess could be a perverse outcome? Yeah, so I think that goes to that enhancing remnant vegetation Um pilot that I said before. So that was a, the enhancing remnant vegetation, um, just to explain it quickly, is uh, when you've got remnant vegetation on your property and the pilot scheme, um, which ran into, well, it's still running now, but was started under the previous government, was paying farmers to protect and enhance that remnant vegetation. So that was, um, the idea of that was really to try and get a positive value on forest on farmers' land. So, you know, we see land clearing across um, so many states in this country. Um, and you can understand that some farmers see that as a negative, you know, that the bit that's under forest is a negative part of their farm. It's not producing income for them. It's probably costing them money. And worse, banks and valuers were valuing it at zero. And that's something, that's another topic that we should get to another day. Um, but so that was the whole point of that, of the enhancing remnant vegetation thing, was to put a positive value on it, make sure the farmer's making money out of it. So that does go um, to what the question is asking, the very valid question of, well, hang on, I've been doing the right thing the whole time. Don't I get something? So under the under the previous scheme, that was the case. Um, I still hope that this scheme can be amended um, to include that again, because I, I just think it's so important. And, you know, the Australian, whilst not an ecologist, um, tree hollows are just such an important part of the Australian ecosystem. We've got 300 native birds and animals that require tree hollows to live in or to breed in. 
when you're knocking those tree hollows out, I mean, 170 years to get most of those tree hollows back to the to the place and and more. Like I read a I read a great study on powerful owls where 50% uh, of their nesting sites were more than 500 years old. So you just you're not going to replace that in a generation. You just can't. So I think protecting that remnant veg is really important, and for that reason and many other reasons, it's really important that we um, do help out the farmers that have been doing the right thing for so long. Great, thank you. Um, we probably have time for one more question. Since we started a little late, we'll go a little late. So given we've spoken so much about offsets and how much of an issue that is to our farmers, how can we actually ensure, and in particular, how can our farmers ensure that the biodiversity certificates created from a nature repair market aren't used as environmental offsets under the EPVC Act or other schemes um, was a question we had. <laughs> That's a brilliant question. Do you want to first go at that, Professor? Uh, I was passing that to you, Les. I just, I, I think that the whole notion of offsets needs to be really carefully rethought in this space. I really do. Otherwise, we're going to kick a whole lot of own goals. And that's, I didn't like doing that in the game that I used to play. And I don't think that we should be doing that here. There's enough to be done in this nature repair area with, without overcomplicating it with things that might be highly ineffective with, with offsets. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really concerned to make sure that we don't have those kinds of things. So the drafting of the bill and how it's amended, I think is going to be really critical to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, so just the, the overlay of it going through the Senate, just for everyone playing along at home. So it'll go to a Senate inquiry and that'll take a couple of months and that'll give all sides. So Labor, Greens, um, Liberals, Nationals, Independents, we'll all get a go at some questions on that. Um, then the Senate report will come back. So that sort of kicks it down the road for a little while. Um, obviously I'm not keen on the offsets thing and it's actually twofold. It's one is that I don't think it protects nature. Um, but the second one is that you'd, I don't think you actually want big companies being able to just buy off massive tracts of farmland and being able to offset their own bulldozing elsewhere. And I don't think that would be a good result. Um, in terms of the, if there were offsets to answer the question asked, um, I do think it, as a basic market principle, the seller should get to choose their customer. And if you don't want to sell, to that customer, if, if you don't like a particular company, then you shouldn't have to sell to them. Um, I think that is I think that is quite doable. I think it is quite possible for um, for the buyer to know who the seller is. I mean, that's what we do with every other commodity. So why can't it be done with this one? Les, since this is in your wheelhouse, if farmers are particularly concerned about offsets being a part of the scheme, what can they actually do now to try and advocate from the, for that to no longer be a part of the scheme? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. I'd, there's probably three things. So you can write to the minister. You could write to Minister Plibersek um, if you Google her. And she's a reasonable person who, and I believe that she's very open to um, to making changes to these bill to this bill if, if needed. Um, so that's, that's number one. Number two, you can make a submission to the Senate inquiry. Um, if you just jump on the APH website, australianparliamenthouse.gov.au, have a look down the inquiries, the Senate inquiries list, and you can get on and make your own submission. Um, you can have your local member stand up for you. That's their job. You know, politicians are on the public dime and they're supposed to represent your views in Canberra. Thanks to whoever just put that up, Karina. Um, yeah, that's probably the three places I'd, that I would start. I think we need we need farmer views in there. You know, if that is, if all farmers deserve to be heard, um, and that is the way that that is a way that you can be heard. That's a great thing that electronics have brought to us now. You can you can literally get on there, type your submission, press enter. Um, and it's taken into account. So I'd encourage everyone to do that. Um, Farmers for Climate Action will also be putting in submissions. So if you want your thoughts um, in that, I think we've already taken them into account, to be honest. That's why we did the survey. But, <laughs> but if you've got any extra thoughts, please let us know. Yes, and that survey, I believe, is still open. So if you hadn't filled it out and you've got some strong feelings, feel free to go ahead and fill that out. You should have received an email about that a couple of weeks back. Um, well, that brings us to the end of the questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to everyone's. We're out of time now. And it also brings us to the end of our Biodiversity on Farm webinar. So thank you so much to our speakers and also to everyone here for attending, submitting your questions and showing such an interest in an important issue. Please look out for the follow-up email with the recording. And we'll also try and make sure a link to that survey is included in that email as well. Um, if you can provide any feedback and any questions you might have, um, there'll also be a link 
um, where you can do that too. So thanks everyone again for coming along. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thanks so much thanks for coming. Everyone. Cheers. Cheers.